Hey, everybody. Before we get into the Season 2 recap of Yellow Jackets, if you need a Season 1 recap, just hit the tab in the upper right-hand corner. It'll take you right to it. Season 2, we're going to pick up with a flashback two months after the events of Season 1. The girls are dead in the middle of winter, and they're struggling a bit, especially Shauna. She's struggling with the fact that her best friend is dead, and she feels like she's part to blame. She copes with it by going outside where Jackie's body is and talking to it as if it's still alive, even though she knows it's not. She tells this dead Jackie all about how her and Jeff became an item, why it happened, but the fact that she's talking to a dead body is cause for concern for the other girls. Although Ben points out, guys, that's how she's coping. As far as Ben's concerned, they have bigger issues, like food. They're running out of it, and they're also getting on each other's nerves quite a bit. One girl in particular named Crystal will not stop singing. It's driving everybody up a wall. At one point, Misty gets the job of being sent out to the cold to grab some water for the umpteenth time that week, and she's miserable, and she overhears Crystal singing and just snaps at her. She ends up telling Crystal, I can't sing, and Crystal, just kind of looking for a friend, says, well, I could teach you. So it seems like at least Misty has one ally because the girls are still pretty pissed off at the whole poisoning the soup fiasco. It's not all bad, though. One person who is doing much better is Van. Face looks pretty healed up. And her and Ty are still a hot item. Although Ty's alter ego at night is becoming a slight issue. She gets pretty violent. And while she's sleeping with Van, she does think it's a bad idea because she has a tendency to kind of attack her a little bit. But Van is not scared of her at all. Even one night in particular, when Thaisa wakes up, starts hooking up with Van and biting her lip pretty hard, causing it to bleed, Van still says to her, I'm not scared of you. I'm not leaving you. And that's a night where Van tells Thaisa for the first time, I love you. It's adorable if you don't know the whole backstory of what Thais is actually capable of. The bigger issue, though, is the lack of food. Every day, Travis and Natalie go out, looking for not only food, but also any sign of Javi. And so far, they've come up completely empty. Before they do go out, they get this weird sort of blessing from Lottie. It's really bizarre. It involves Lottie pricking her finger, putting the blood in some water, and then Natalie and Travis drinking it. Natalie doesn't really think it's doing anything, but as Lottie points out, you keep coming back alive, don't you? They do, although they also keep coming back without food. Natalie, though, is getting pretty good at charting different areas, figuring out where they've been and where to go to next. She's been kind of putting a map together with Ben, and Ben has to break the news to her that Javi's probably dead. I mean, it's almost impossible to think he survived the winter out there alone. And Natalie tells him, I know that but I don't want to dash Travis's hopes. One night, as Trav and Natalie are staring at the fire, Trav just comes out and says, I know you think he's dead. And she doesn't deny it, she just states the facts. It's been two months in this cold. And that's when Travis seems to have a panic attack. Lottie rushes over to help him out, to calm him down, and her exercises not only work, but they give Travis a vision of a massive tree stump with a bunch of candles... Not only does it work, but Travis ends up getting a boner from it. That's how exciting this vision was. When he finally kind of snaps out of it, Lottie just tells him, Your brother's alive. I know he is. And Natalie rushes after Lottie, pulling her aside and said, What the hell are you doing? You're giving him false hope. Lottie looks at her and says, What do you want me to say? I said what I felt. And Natalie says, I want you to say less. The next day, Travis and Natalie head out as they always do, but Natalie ends up coming across something really bizarre. The entire area is covered with snow, except the foot of this one tree, where moss continues to grow. Travis doesn't really think anything of it and says, come on. But the fact that they're not bringing back food is starting to really make some people go crazy, like Shauna, who ends up going out one time, talking to the dead body of Jackie and accidentally knocking it over. And when she does that, Jackie's ear falls off because this body has been dead for two months. So what does Shauna do? Well, she decides to eat it. Now, present day Shauna is dealing with the fact that she murdered her ex-lover and the cops might be calling for her. So she's enlisted Misty to help her out with the interrogation process, trying to figure out what the cops might ask so that she has the proper answers for it. Shauna, though, does seem like this is a little ridiculous. 
She feels like they were careful enough, and Misty says, no, I feel like we missed something. She asks Shauna if she got rid of all of Adam's stuff, and while Shauna says yes, she does hesitate, leading Missy to believe that there's no shot in hell she got rid of all of it, covering her tracks. And it's true, Shauna didn't. She's got some of Adam's belongings in her safe, and then she remembers the art studio. She calls up Jeff for help regarding that front. They head there to see what they find, and what they find is a little troubling because Adam was painting a bunch of pictures of Shauna. Different kinds of pictures pretty clear if the cops start looking at Shauna and they see the paintings they're gonna put two and two together and figure out these two were together it's also really awkward for Jeff I mean he's handling the situation pretty well but this is just another shot of the ego so Shauna tries to make him feel better by saying that she was always worried about Jeff with another guy but it also kind of turned her on the idea of it all this murder all this adultery all these paintings even the weird one Ends up leading the two to hook up right then and there, with Jeff bending her over and giving her four good minutes. Once they wrap that up, they realize, yeah, we do have to do something about these paintings, and they simply ruin them. They then head home, they get the rest of Adam's stuff, and they start to burn it in their barbecue, while also making hot dogs to make it look like they were actually cooking. They sit down for dinner that night, and Shauna and Jeff are acting like it's business as usual, which is driving Callie up a wall. She already confronted Shauna about Adam, but Shauna didn't own up to the fact that she was the one who killed him. She knows, though, that something is going on, and the fact that her two parents are acting like it's business as usual really piss her off. She does get confirmation that her mom had something to do with it when she sneaks out, looks into the coals, and finds Adam's burnt driver's license. While Shauna, though, thinks that they've taken care of everything, Misty just couldn't sit on her laurels. She headed to that local citizen's detective forum that she checks out all the time. And she found Adam's case and a really troubling post from a guy who was able to locate Adam's credit card statement and figure out that Adam was clearly seeing somebody by some of the purchases. This guy points to the fact that Adam must have had a lover and maybe the girlfriend did it. She goes and talks to Natalie at the motel about it only to find out that Natalie isn't there. So she goes to the front desk asking where she went And after basically blackmailing the guy at the front, she finds out that Natalie checked out the previous night, paid in cash, left. And Misty finds that super weird that Natalie would leave without telling her. So she goes to the motel, starts looking around, and sees that somebody must have broken in because there's wood chips on the ground, the door frame looks messed up. And as we know, somebody did break in. They kidnapped Natalie, and they took her to what looks like a retreat space in the woods that's run by Lottie. We get a look at what happened with Lottie once the girls were found and rescued and returned. Lottie didn't say a word. Her parents got super concerned. They sent her to a mental institution where the doctors had her do brain stimulation therapy. When she went through these therapy sessions, she did have visions of her walking up a damp hallway with a bunch of candles. But when she did finally wake up from this, she was a different person. She seemed like she was the same Lottie, but actually improved. And she actually looked to help those in the institution around her. She would use the same breathing technique that she used with Travis, the one where he saw the vision. When she became an adult, she seemed to buy a property on a lake. And I don't want to say she was running a cult, but she kind of seemed to be running a retreat slash therapy group slash, let's call it what it is, looked an awful lot like a cult. And it also looked like the same location where the girls crashed. We're talking woods, lakes, cabins. I mean, that's pretty generic, but still. So that's where Natalie was taken, to one of those cabins. And she doesn't really take too kindly to the fact that she's chained to a bed. When one of Lottie's followers comes in, she brings her food, but says, we chained you up because we were worried you were going to hurt yourself. I wonder where we came up with that idea. Natalie, though, doesn't look to hurt herself. She looks to hurt this girl and escape. She does that, stabbing her in the hand with a fork and running off. She's chased by what looked like a few of Lottie's followers, and she heads into the woods. And that's where she comes across a ceremony going on. She gets some heavy flashbacks from her time as a teenager because the people during this ceremony are all wearing animal masks. They unrobe one man, force him to get in a hole, and start digging dirt on him. When Lottie finally makes her appearance... She looks like she's going through this spiritual ceremony, but Natalie comes out of the woods with a stick and starts swinging it. She looks at Lottie and says, give me one reason I shouldn't cave your head in and put it in that hole. 
And Lottie says, because I have a message for you from Travis. And the final yellow jacket that we'll talk about is Thaisa, who still needs to be sworn into office. She's getting used to that job, but she's also trying to do damage control at work. She knows that she needs to get Sammy a new dog. So she goes and gets Steve the puppy, where she meets a woman at the shelter who actually campaigned for her. While she appreciates the support, she can't stay long because she has to get over to Sammy's school and try to pick him up before Simone does. She is the first one to get to Sammy, and Sammy's thrilled to see Steve the dog, but when Simone sees that Thaisa came to pick him up, she gets pissed off. She tells Sammy to go wait in the car and then reams Thaisa out, telling her that she found her little project in the basement, to which Thaisa has no idea what Simone is talking about. But Simone is legitimately concerned, not just for Sammy and herself, but for Thaisa and her mental health. Something clearly is going on with her. So she gives her an ultimatum. If you don't step down from office and seek treatment for whatever it is that's happening to you, I will have no choice but to go to the press. That night, when Thaisa gets home, she decides to go in the basement, snoop around, and she is able to find what Simone was talking about. She's mortified, but sadly, she's not stunned. And for whatever reason, she picks up Steve the dog, showing him, and tells him, hey, this was a mistake, I'll do better with you. I'm sure that'll make Steve the dog feel better. That dude's probably like, you know what, I'm better off at the shelter. In episode two, Thaisa is doing everything to try to get her mind off of the Sammy issue, the Simone issue. She's working out, she's cleaning the house. But one particular afternoon, Sammy's just back. He's standing there in her house, and he tells her that he snuck off from school, walked home, just to meet Steve the dog. Ty knows that this is going to be a big issue for Simone, so she immediately calls her up and says, hey, don't get mad at me, but Sammy walked home. And Simone thinks that Thaisa convinced Sammy to do this, but she says, all right, fine, I'll be right over. When Simone eventually does arrive, though, Sammy's gone. They go up to his room and his window is open, and they worry that he ran away. So they immediately hop in the car and start driving around trying to find him. Short while later, they get a phone call from Sammy's school telling him that Sammy was never picked up. That's because Sammy never showed up at Thaisa's house. Even though she thinks he did, he didn't. It was all a figment of her imagination. And Simone once again hammers home the point that Thaisa is not well. As Simone is trying to explain to her that she needs to get the help that she needs, Thaisa gives her a crazy kind of look, speeds the car up, and gets in a car accident. And over at Shauna's house, they're also going with a little bit of drama with their kids, but that's because Callie can't get over the fact that her parents lied to her. They clearly killed Adam. It's all she can think about, so much so that she breaks up with her boyfriend. Whenever she does seem to forget about it, it gets brought back up. Like when Kevin shows up at their house one day, knocks on the door, and starts asking Shauna some questions. Mainly, did she know Adam Martin? And at first she plays dumb, and then she slowly says, well, yeah, actually, we got in a car accident together, but that's about it. But Kevin brings up the fact that they have a lot of text messages between the two. And she plays it off like, yeah, I tried to get his insurance information, and he ended up being kind of a dick. Callie, who's in the other room and hears all of this, decides to give her mother a lifeline by interrupting the conversation and saying, come on, Mom, we got to go. We're going to be late. That gets Kevin to say, you know what, if we have any more questions, we'll contact you. It does seem like, though, because of their history, Kevin does believe what she's saying. It's not like Callie, though, is happy with her mom. She yells at her for lying to the police, and Shauna says, I did it for your dad. Small town like this, if people found out that I had an affair, they'll start looking at him differently. And Callie's just disgusted by all of it because her mother continues to act like she didn't kill Adam. Callie needs to talk to somebody, so she heads to the bar with her friend. All her friend really wants to talk about, though, is why she broke up with her boyfriend. But then they notice there's an older guy at the bar who is clearly checking Callie out. Her friend makes a flipping comment like, you should go flirt back and go back to his place. And Callie says, you know what? I think I should. And even though her friend was joking, Callie walks up to the guy and starts chatting him up. She starts flirting with him pretty heavy, asks him to buy her a drink. But it turns out the two share a little bit of a connection between them. The guy tells her that he's in town because his parents, after about 26 years, are finally separating, and he's helping his mom move out. And Callie can absolutely relate to what's going on at her place. She reveals to this guy that her mom cheated on her dad and just things aren't great at home. 
Kelly doesn't end up going home with Jay, the guy at the bar. And it's a pretty good thing because everything that Jay told her was a lie. Jay is actually an undercover cop working with Kevin. He was tailing Callie, and now he can confirm that Shauna was cheating on Jeff. Jay wants to bring her in right now, but Kevin, who doesn't seem to be a big fan of Jay's methods, tells him, slow down, dude. You're going to screw all of this up. With all the time she spent getting rid of Adam's stuff and lying to her daughter, Shauna just hasn't had time to get back to Misty. Misty's been calling Shauna and Taisa, for that matter, trying to get in touch with one of them to let them know that it's pretty clear Nat was taken. There was a security camera footage outside of the crappy motel, and she decides to put it in that Citizens Detective blog. And no one seems to know how to hack into it except one guy. It's the same guy that was able to hack into Adam's credit cards and see that he was seeing somebody. Misty's been crapping all over his theories, and he tells her, I might have an idea, but only if you stop shitting all over my Adam Martin theories. And she writes back, well, I might have an idea too. Stop wasting our time with wild goose chases. This random guy doesn't respond on the message board. No, instead, he decides to visit Misty at work. There's a guy who comes to the nursing home with his mother, and he just doesn't really look the part. He's asking a whole lot of questions, and he decides to sneak off and covertly leave Misty a note. Although, when she opens it up, it appears to be just a blank piece of paper. It's not, though. When Misty gets home, she realizes that he wrote everything in invisible ink. He tells her that the security camera was just a dummy, but there is a man staying at the hotel who has been there for a couple months. He thinks he's being interrogated by the FBI the next day, and the guy asks Misty if she wants to come along and join in whatever it is they're going to do. Misty's willing to do whatever it takes to get Natalie back, and Natalie's actually safe. She's not happy about being kidnapped and dragged to a cult commune, but for all intents and purposes, she's safe. And as for the kidnapping, Lottie explains that she was worried about Natalie after Travis died, so she had a couple of people follow her around. When those same people saw Natalie put a shotgun in her mouth, they had to act quickly, and that resulted in a what looked to be kidnapping. When they finally get some alone time, Lottie explains to Natalie what happened with Travis. The night that Travis died, he had called Lottie and said that the wilderness had come back to haunt him. And he said, I know what I have to do, and then he hung up. Lottie panicked, so she drove all night, and by the time she found him, he was a mess. He told Lottie that day that the only way to confront the darkness was to get to as close to death as possible. When everybody almost died, they had a vision, so that's what he wants to do. But Lottie grabs him and says, Stop reliving this. You're in the vice grip of your trauma. And using the same method she did back in the 90s, she's able to calm Travis down. Lottie did ask Travis if she wanted her to reach out to Natalie, but he said no that Natalie would only make things worse. Lottie stayed with Travis that night to make sure he was okay, but when she dozed off, Travis got into his van and drove off to the farm that he worked at. He left instructions on how to get into his bank account and also a note that said, tell Natalie she was right. By the time that Lottie reached Travis, he had set up a bunch of candles in the shape of the symbol and was prepared to hang himself just for a little bit, just to get close to death to be able to talk to the darkness. Lottie tried to get him to stop, but he said, Lottie, if you walk away, I'm going to do it anyway. So you might as well just be here. As soon as I pass out, lower me down. Reluctantly, Lottie agreed. But when it came time to lower Travis down after he passed out, the button broke. She had no way of getting him down, and Travis died. That is a pretty tough story for Natalie to believe. She says to Lottie, I know there's something you're not telling me. And there is something that she's not telling her. It's the fact that while she was trying to get the buttons to work, she went into a trance-like state where she had a visit from Laura Lee. She got so distracted with Laura Lee that she left Travis alone for a little bit, and Travis started raising up into the barn farther. But it wasn't Laura Lee. It was a demonic version of Laura Lee. By the time that Lottie snapped out of it, Travis was high up in that barn. There was no way of saving him. So she just cleaned everything up and went home. Natalie wants to get the hell out of there and get back to civilization, but Lottie tells her you're not going to be able to do that. There's no way off. You're not leaving until you're well rested. So unfortunately, Natalie's kind of a prisoner at the moment. And that's how the girls felt 20 plus years ago. But the prisoners were growing restless. On top of it, they've got a little bit of a hygiene issue because somebody took a number two in the bucket inside the cabin. That's a big no-no, and nobody owns up to it. 
So tensions are pretty high because they're low on food and now you've got people taking smashes indoors. Everybody though eventually calms down. They go to bed that night and Van wakes up and Ty's not there. She knows that Ty must be sleepwalking so she goes out of the cabin and she catches Ty right before she's about to walk off a cliff. Both of them are pretty terrified about what could have happened. And once Ty gets back to the cabin, she starts telling Van the last thing she remembers, which is just falling asleep. Van asks her, is there anything on your mind that might be bothering you? And Ty says, yeah, the fact that Shauna is still talking to Jackie's dead body outside. The girls are kind of split on this. Some think that it's weird and others just feel like it's the grieving process. And Van seems to be in the latter. Van suggests that maybe Ty used to talk to Lottie because she did help Travis with whatever he was going through. But Ty used to is completely against that. And not only does she talk to Lottie, she doesn't want Van talking to Lottie either. When the girls wake up the next morning, they're all going through their chores. Travis and Natalie have gone off to try to find food. And Shauna walks out of the shed, the same one that she's been talking to Jackie in. And that's the final straw for Thaisa. She walks in and she is horrified by what she sees. Because Jackie's dead body is done up, like via makeup. Thaisa thinks that all Sean has been doing in there is playing dress up and doll with a dead corpse. She's pretty freaked out by it. In front of everybody, she says, go ahead, Shauna, tell them what you've been up to with Jackie. Shauna's pretty embarrassed by this as she's being shamed by Thaisa and finally Lottie steps in to defend her. Thaisa backs off a little bit but says, Shauna, we got to do something about this. For your own good, we have to get rid of this body. Shauna tries to resist saying it's too cold to bury her and Thaisa says, fine, then we'll cremate her. And unfortunately for Shauna, she doesn't really have a lot of support in this matter and all the girls seem to be on board with cremating the body of Jackie. It is awkward for Shauna once they bring the body out of that shed. They start discussing if it's worth taking Jackie's clothes because it is the middle of winter, and Shauna does fight them on that. Lottie does, however, take off Jackie's necklace and put it around Shauna. Right before nightfall hits, Travis and Natalie come back to see what's going on with Jackie's body. They're pretty surprised at the scene. And then someone notices that Natalie is holding something. It's a pair of Javi's pants, bloodied. Natalie said that she found them in the middle of the woods, but in reality, she took those pants out of Javi's stuff, cut her leg and spread some blood on it so she could finally give Travis some closure. When Lottie sees the pants, she goes, no, that's impossible. I know he's still alive. And Natalie starts screaming at her to stop because she's doing more harm than good. But the infighting stops once they see Shauna ready to light the fire. She gives a little bit of a speech about how she let Jackie down, how much she meant to her, and then she lights the wood. Travis grabs the pair of pants, stuffs it in the wood, and says, goodbye, Javi. So it's a moment of closure for everybody. They then head inside the cabin and let the body burn while they all go to sleep. As the movie Wedding Crashers taught us, Grief is nature's most powerful aphrodisiac, and Travis and Natalie prove that by having sex that night, not going to sleep. But while they're doing that, Travis is getting these visions, much like when Lottie touched his chest. While he's having sex with Natalie, it's as if Lottie is in the room watching it go down. He eventually does finish, and they eventually go to sleep, but everybody is woken up in the middle of the night with a wonderful aroma of barbecue. That's because in the middle of the night, there was a wind gust, and a bunch of snow landed on the body and put the fire out. For a group of people that haven't eaten in a while, this is a very enticing aroma, despite the fact that it's one of their friends. For Shauna especially, who's pregnant, she walks up to the body and says she wants us to. And what she means by that is Jackie wants us to eat her. It's not like they dive right in. They are a little conflicted, but they're also hungry as hell. So, one by one, they start delicately eating the body until finally they just really dig into it. The only one who doesn't is Ben. He's completely disgusted and turned off by the whole thing. He can't believe that these girls have suddenly become cannibals. In episode 3, the girls wake up and they're all pretty mortified at what they did, but nobody more so than Thaisa. And that's because Thaisa doesn't remember eating Jackie's body. Van actually has to stop her and say, Thaisa... We did this to her body. You were right next to me. You ate her face. And when Taisa hears that, she literally throws up right then and there. She's completely disgusted. 
But the body is pretty picked apart. I mean, the girls did a number on it, and they don't want to look at it. So Natalie suggests, you know what, I'll take the body and put it with the plane. We'll wait until the ground is soft enough to bury her, and then we'll bury her. Natalie packs up what's left of Jackie and heads off. As Natalie treks off into the woods, Lottie walks up to Shauna and says, that's what Jackie would have wanted. I mean, maybe not for the rest of us, but for you and the baby. And Shauna tells her, yeah, but I wanted it too. And that's what's scary to Shauna. She feels so messed up about this. Lottie tries to make her feel better by saying, Shauna, we all ate her. But that doesn't make Shauna feel better at all. And Lottie knows that she has to boost Shauna's spirits somehow, so she decides that all the girls will hold a baby shower. Lottie says aloud that she wants to welcome him. And Shauna's a little puzzled about why Lottie said him, but Lottie doesn't expand on it, just saying, yeah, we'll have a baby shower. This boosts all of the girls' spirits. They all get excited about what they're going to give the new baby. But as they're planning... Natalie reaches the plane and she's giving a little speech to Jackie about what they did, apologizing, thanking her for her ultimate sacrifice. But shortly after she finishes, she hears something outside and it's a albino moose. She quickly grabs her gun, she starts firing at it, and this moose starts charging at her, knocking into the plane and knocking Natalie back. But when she gets back up, that moose is gone, as if it were just a figment of her imagination. She figures that her mind's just playing tricks on her, and she decides to head back to the cabin. At the cabin, the girls have kind of broken into teams of two with creating gifts for the child. And one of those groups is Crystal and Misty. As Crystal and Misty are creating something for the baby, they start hinting at the fact that eating Jackie wasn't terrible. And that's when Crystal admits that it wasn't the first time she's eaten somebody because apparently she ate her twin in the womb. Yeah, Crystal's a little unhinged, but... That's why she works well with Misty. Mari, though, is sitting not too far away, and she keeps hearing a dripping sound. It's really bothering her. But nobody is more bothered than Ben. I mean, he's looking at these girls, and all he can think of is them frothing at the mouth. Since seeing them eat Jackie, he's been pretty despondent. He's been trying to keep to himself and thinking about what life could have been like. Because he had a boyfriend back home, and that boyfriend wanted him to move in, but Ben said no. So he's just picturing what would have happened had he not gotten on that plane, had he said yes to moving in with that guy. So Ben is not going to be partaking in the baby shower the next day. That night, though, when all the girls go to sleep, Thaisa wakes up and she's seemingly taken over by whatever has her sleepwalk. And Van finally wants some answers. Van has been tying her wrist to Thaisa's in order to keep her in the bed so that she doesn't walk off. But Van says, if I let you loose, can I come with? And whatever is controlling Thaisa says, yes. They take off into the middle of the woods in the middle of the night. And Van says, well, how do you know where you're going? And Thaisa says, he chose me, the one with no eyes. Van asks, is that who you always follow? And Thaisa says, only when Thaisa lets me. Basically confirming that Thaisa has been taken over by something. Van does ask, Hey, if you're not Thaisa, then who are you? But whoever it is doesn't answer. It just leads Van to a tree with the symbol carved in it. And that's when Thaisa snaps out of it, having no idea how she got there. Van lets her know that Thaisa was the one who brought her there, and it's as if she knew that that symbol was carved into the tree. Van asks her, who is the one with no eyes? But Thaisa lies and says, I don't know. They head back to the cabin, and the next day, the girls have the baby shower. They start giving the gifts, and one of the gifts is from Misty. It's a monologue from Steel Magnolia. It's an interesting choice because it's a scene about a dead daughter. But, to her credit, Misty crushes it. I mean, she really impresses everybody. The last gift, though, is from Lottie. It's a blanket that she knitted, but it has the symbol on it. And when Natalie sees that symbol, she freaks out. She thinks it's completely inappropriate because, as she reminds everybody, we found that symbol next to a guy's dead corpse. Lottie points out that she thinks the dead guy was using the symbol as protection, but Natalie says, Lottie, he died. And they start arguing over the fact that Natalie doesn't understand what the symbol is. Most of the group, though, sides with Lottie because they just believe that she clearly knows things. They've seen it firsthand. But then they all get distracted because they notice that Shauna is bleeding from the nose. 
As they start trying to tend to Shona's nosebleed, they hear something pelting the roof, and when they go outside, they're horrified because it's a slew of dead birds. They have no idea how these birds died. It's as if they just all committed suicide. They're not quite sure what to do, and Lottie says we should gather them as blessings. And one by one, the girls start placing the dead birds at Lottie's feet. Present day Lottie is still running her cult, and Natalie is still forced to be there. At least she's not chained up in a bed, though. She's able to walk around the grounds as she wishes. There are a bunch of activities that you can do at this commune. And as Natalie is looking over the chart, Lottie walks up and says, you know, you should sign up for one. I mean, the group wants to hear from you. Lottie then shows Natalie the beehives that they have, and she explains that when a new queen is born, the first thing she does is stab all of the other queen bees to death, so she's the last remaining one. But it's not brutal, it's natural. It's what has to be done. Otherwise, they starve, so the queen has to. She then kind of guilt trips Natalie to going to one of these group therapy sessions, and Natalie doesn't want to share, but Lottie calls upon her. She tells her that it's really important that she's present for all of these exercises in order to get the most out of it. Natalie reluctantly stands up and Lottie asks her, is there anything you want to process in front of the group? And Natalie says, no, not at all. And that's when Lottie calls up Lisa, the girl that Natalie stabbed with a fork in the hand. She has Lisa tell the group what she felt when Natalie attacked her. She then hands Lisa a fork and says, if you feel the need to hurt Natalie back, I want you to do it. And it seems like Lisa certainly wants to, but she doesn't. She actually just hugs Natalie, telling her, I forgive you. After the therapy session, Lottie heads out and notices that near all the beehives, there are a ton of dead bees on top. And when she opens up the honeycomb, they're covered in blood. She has no idea what happened. She's pretty beside herself. But she snapped out of it when one of her workers asks, do you want to go to lunch? And when Lottie looks down, the beehive is fine. She was imagining all of it. And imagining things is something that Thais is going through as well. She doesn't really remember how the car accident happened, but she is really concerned for Simone because she's not doing great. And she gets really, really concerned when she notices that on Simone's hand is the symbol. She heads into the bathroom in the hospital, and she looks like hell. On top of it, the person staring back at her is not herself. Taisa is screaming at who's ever staring at her, tell me what you want. But this fake Taisa is just kind of covering part of her face while only showing one eye. It's weird. Taisa runs out, and her campaign leader is waiting for her to let her know that the toxicology report came back, and she's got Adderall in her system, but that's nothing. But she cuts her off and just says, I need your car keys, and then calls Jessica Roberts. As for Shauna, her and Jeff have an uncomfortable conversation over breakfast. Jeff is trying to figure out the moment when he became less fun, and he thinks he knows it. Really, he's just trying to process why Shauna would cheat on him, and she tries to explain to him that it's not his fault, but Jeff says, I know it's my fault. I mean, what are you supposed to say? Of course it's my fault. So when they leave, he decides to do something spontaneous and take her to Colonial Williamsburg. On the way there, though, a guy runs out into the street and Jeff thinks that he hit him. And when they get out to check on him, the guy's trying to carjack him. He's got a gun pointed at Jeff and Shauna, but Shauna knocks into the guy and steals the gun away from him. And that, for whatever reason, causes an argument between Jeff and Shauna because Jeff wants to get the gun away from Shauna. And in the meantime, the guy steals their minivan. Shauna starts saying why the minivan was important, what was in it that they can't get back, but Jeff is concerned that his wife is suddenly turning into Rambo. In order to blow off some steam, Jeff decides afterwards to head to the gym, and he runs into Kevin and confronts him, saying, you know, you really upset my wife the other day. I mean, do you really think Shauna had anything to do with this? And Kevin has to explain the reason why he thinks Shauna had something to do with it, the fact that the investigators found out that she was cheating. Jeff, though, gaslights Kevin completely, acting like he's insane for looking at Shauna, while simultaneously seeming desperate to get Kevin off the scent. Meanwhile, Shauna was going to track down the car. She's able to locate where the minivan went thanks to her GPS, and instead of calling the cops, she takes matters into her own hands, walking into this chop shop and confronting the guy who stole it. 
At first, the guy tries to just play tough with her, saying that she's not really going to use the gun. But then Shauna starts talking about what it's like to peel the skin off of the human face, and the guy actually gets concerned. When Shauna mentions that she's not shaking because she's scared of using the gun, she's actually shaking because of how badly she does want to use the gun. The guy all but hands the keys over and runs out. So, yeah, Shauna's become Rambo. But Misty's become True Detective. Misty goes to meet with this mystery man who she found out's name is Walter. They meet at a boat and they're going to pretend to be FBI agents investigating this guy that was staying at the motel. But Misty gets concerned because the guy is Randy, the guy she knew from high school. Misty knows that she can't interview him, so she ends up calling Walter's phone and he's going to put in an earpiece so that he can get questions from Misty. Randy's too dumb to realize that Walter is not actually a member of the FBI, but they do end up getting some information out of him. Mainly the fact that there were some shady individuals in a van and they took all the Fanta. And while that doesn't seem like much on the surface, Misty realizes that they can track these people down by looking at the credit card information from the vending machine. Walter has a really good knack of hacking. He does, however, ask Misty, why are you downvoting all my Adam Martin posts? And Misty lies, telling Walter that she's friends with Adam's mother, and Adam had addiction issues. So she downvoted all of his stuff because she didn't want that information getting out into the world and upsetting his mother. Walter says, wow, that's really nice of you. And Misty says, I knew you'd understand because you're trying to get your own mother really good health care. And Walter laughs and tells her, oh, Svetlana? No, she's not my mother. She's just some woman I knew who was getting evicted. Misty then questions why in the world Walter would do all of that to meet her. And Walter says, maybe I'm just a bored Moriarty looking for a Sherlock. Misty, who is not used to having male admirers, doesn't really know what to say and leaves. But she gets a text message later from Walter that tells her the credit card is from Cherry Corners, New York. And he asks her, do you want to go on a road trip? In episode four, it's the next day after Lottie had her spell with the beehive, and she's planning on running some errands, which include going to the bank, and for that, she dresses more casual. That's when Natalie approaches her. Natalie has been trying to get into her office for quite some time, just alone, and one of the ways she figures she can do that is by snaking her keys, but she uses the excuse of going to the market to sell honey. That's how the cult makes a lot of their money, and the person that usually sells it is Lisa, She usually goes with a guy named Todd, but Natalie convinces Lottie to give her the keys, let her drive over, so that Lisa and Natalie can kind of get over their differences. Lottie thinks it's a great idea, so she hands over the keys. Just warning Natalie, you drive. Lisa has no idea how to do that. And maybe Lottie did go to the bank, but the real place that she stopped off at was her therapist. Although it's not her normal therapist. It's somebody different. She's been going to the same guy for the past 10 years, every six months, like clockwork, but she decided to show up early this time, and she tells her therapist, I need you to up my medication. I'm sure you read in my file what I've been through before, and I've started having visions again for the first time in decades. The last time I had these, I became something different. I don't want that to happen again, because I've worked really hard to rehabilitate my life. The doctor asks Lottie, well, you're suppressing these visions, which means they might come back stronger. So you have to ask yourself, what are these visions trying to tell you? Lottie looks at the doctor a little dumbfounded and says, they're trying to tell me nothing because they're not real. As Lottie, though, was busy with her therapist, Natalie and Lisa headed off. And on their way to the farmer's market, they started having a conversation about the ridiculous rules of the cult. Lisa buying into them and Natalie thinking a lot of it's just ridiculous. A lot of these rules are presented as giving the person freedom when in reality they're pretty restrictive. One of those rules is you're not supposed to visit your family. I'm sorry, it's not that they're not allowed, it's just Lottie doesn't think it's a good idea because their anchors are at the compound. And while Lisa doesn't really want to visit her mom, the person she wants to visit isn't a person, it's a fish. She misses her little fish, but it requires her going to visit her mom, and that's an uncomfortable conversation because her mom misses her daughter. Although Lisa had a lot of issues, and she reassures her mom that by going to Lottie's cult... It's helped her. She's better now. Her mother, though, is very concerned, and Natalie puts her two cents in, saying, what does it matter? Your daughter's happy. Natalie's input isn't really wanted by either Lisa or her mother. So finally, Lisa's mom says, can we just talk, like, privately, mother-daughter? And Natalie has to go in the other room. But she's eavesdropping. She's overhearing all of it, and finally it gets enough for her. 
She tries to do her best to stick up for Lisa because she feels like her mom is misunderstanding her. And Lisa snaps at her saying, you're not helping. But the damage is done. Lisa's mom doesn't want to have this conversation with her. And Lisa just has to leave without her fish. Although Natalie wasn't about to let that happen. She puts the fish into her mouth, sneaks out, and then spits it out into a jar. Telling Lisa in the car, there you go. There's your fish. One of the fears that Lisa's mom had was that Lisa would kill the fish because she just wasn't responsible enough. And that's something that Lisa brings up at the bar because Lisa and Natalie never get to the farmer's market. Lisa's a little worried that her mom might be right. But for the meantime, she's thrilled to have her fish back. And when they get back to the cult, she proudly starts showing it off. Natalie's smoking a cigarette. She's watching all this. But then she notices that Lottie's office is open and Natalie has the keys. She finally has her opportunity to get inside. And the reason it's open is because when Lottie returned from the therapist, she started looking at these notes that were written by some of the people in the cult. And then she saw a playing card. It was the Queen of Hearts with her eyes scribbled out of it. This is really troubling to Lottie. She definitely recognizes the card. So she left her office, walking down to a tree stump and cutting her hand open, squeezing so a lot of blood comes out of it. And she doesn't seem happy about having to do this. Lottie, though, is unaware that another one of her former Yellow Jackets teammates is on the way to see her, Misty. She took Walter up on his offer to head up and see if they could find the cult. This road trip's going to be a little bit, so Walter hands her a bunch of cassette tapes and says, here, I'll let you DJ. And she gets really concerned because they're all show tunes. She feels like Walter is just another Yellow Jackets fanatic who wants to spend some time with one of the girls. And she starts freaking out at him, but he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not that at all. I mean, I'm sure your story is interesting and and, and all, but no, I literally just want to spend time with the citizen detective known as African Grey. It turns out these two just both share a love of show tunes. A couple hours later, they arrive in the area of where the cult will be located, but they don't actually know how to find it, and they stop off at a diner. As they eat, she finds out that Walter is a millionaire. He got hit in the head and sued the company for millions of dollars, so... He kind of just does this citizen detective thing now. Their waitress then comes over to ask them if they want anything. And Misty says, yeah, do you know where the cult is around here? And the woman doesn't, but she does know that they sell honey at a local farmer's market. And it just so happens to be that day. Although when they go to the farmer's market, they don't find anybody. Because Natalie's a bad influence on Lisa. But the woman who usually sells her stuff right next to the cult informs them on where they could probably find the group. Misty wants to go that night, but Walter says, no, no, no. We should wait till morning. We think we have the element of surprise, but we don't. There's a bed and breakfast not too far away. We can just go there. So they do, and they get separate rooms at the behest of Misty. And it turns out these two are like two peas in a pod. I mean, their bedtime routine is basically the same exact thing. But they both turn in for the night, and they have plans on the next day tracking down, hopefully, Natalie and the Colt. Now, this whole time, Misty has still been trying to get in touch with Thaisa or Shauna to give them an update, but both of them have been blowing her off. Shauna's been dealing with the whole issue of, you know, she killed a guy. She also has her husband who just doesn't really believe her. Shauna tells him that the police just happened to find the minivan, and he doesn't buy that. He then informs her that the police know about the affair, and Shauna's pretty shocked by that. She can't figure out how they would know, but he says, well, they do. I overheard it at the gym. Callie then walks in the kitchen and informs both of her parents that she's going to be staying over at a friend's house that night, something she's been doing pretty recently. But later on that day, when Shauna was doing some errands, she ran into that girl's mom, and she thanked her, saying, hey, I know Callie's been staying at your place a while. I'll send you money for rent and board. But the woman says, Callie hasn't stayed over our house. And now Shauna knows that Callie's been lying. She's worried about her daughter, and she starts snooping in her bedroom, And she finds condoms, which are cool. But she also finds the charred remains of Adam's license. And she knows that Callie knows. So she tracks her daughter down and drives her to a location where the two can just talk. And that's where Shauna finally comes clean to Callie about what happened with Adam. She owns up to the fact that she killed him and explains why, how Jeff had a hand in it. And Callie can't understand what her dad would even blackmail the Yellow Jackets over. And Shauna says, look, we did things out there. I'm not ready to tell you about them, but we did some things that we're not proud of. Callie accepts it, and Shauna then just says, hey, you can't tell anybody about what I just told you, okay? 
And Callie says, I won't. The two head home, and Shauna tells Jeff, I told Callie everything. And at first, Jeff is really upset. He can't believe that Shauna is dragging their daughter into this, but she tries to explain she already knew. We might as well be honest with her. And the honesty does work, because to Jeff's shock, Callie walks in, and he thought that she was at a friend's house. And without even being pressed on it, Callie owns up to the fact that she's been lying about going to a friend's house. She's really been drinking in the woods, but she says, I'm not going to do that anymore. So Sean has been blowing off Misty because of family issues, and Thais has been blowing off Misty because things are getting weird with her. She took her campaign manager's car, and she seemingly blacked out, waking up on the side of the road with an empty tank, having no idea how she got there. She starts walking down the street, and a trucker pulls over. He recognizes her, and he convinces her to get in the cab by saying, hey, I voted for you. A little while later, that trucker drops her off in the middle of a small town in front of a video store. That's right, 2023, they still have video stores. But it's not just any video store, because this video store is run by Van. Now, 20-something years ago, these two were an item, and they were close. But Thais's propensity to wake up in the middle of the night and walk towards trees with symbols in it has got Van thinking that she really should have a conversation with Lottie. And that was something that Thaisa was totally against. And Van just couldn't understand why. She simply headed back to the cabin to go to bed. The next day, they find out, though, that there's a thief among them. Shauna walks in saying someone's stealing bear meat. And, of course, nobody owns up to it. Maury actually blames Ben because he had the audacity to not eat Jackie. So, there go, he must be hungry. And Ben says, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I can't exactly get around very easy, but... If I did, what are you going to do? Are you going to eat me? Mario starts walking towards Ben pretty confrontationally, and Natalie gets in the middle and says, everyone needs to chill. And Mari turns it on Natalie, saying, this is all your fault, because you haven't found any game. You're going out there hunting, coming back empty, and you're refusing Lottie's help. She tries to bless you, and you turn it away. The girls start discussing all of the quote-unquote coincidences that have happened because of Lottie. The bear even showing up. The dead birds. Some think that it's strictly Lottie, and others think it's just a mere coincidence. So Natalie says, you know what, I'm sick of this. If you guys think that she's a better hunter than me, let's have a competition. We'll both head out there separately, and we'll both try to kill something and bring it back. And poor Lottie, she doesn't even have a say in this. Mari all but volunteers her. So it's set. A little while later, both girls strapped up and headed out in the wild. Lottie, armed with a knife, didn't really know what to do. She walked around the woods. She found a symbol on a tree, but it's as if she was trying to harness the forest. She then came to an empty tree stump. She cut her hand, just like she would do with the colt years later, and she drizzled the blood all over the snow. Suddenly, she was in front of a snow-covered plain, the same plain that Laura Lee was in when it exploded. Somehow, it's back. When she opens it up, you've got Laura Lee's teddy bear, you've got Laura Lee's necklace, And then there's an opening to a shaft. Lottie headed down. And suddenly she was in a mall. A mall that the girls all used to go to. And all the girls are actually there in the food court. In fact, they got Lottie some food because she looked hungry. They also mention the fact that Lottie looks really cold. And Lottie is cold. But she's also very confused. She has no idea how this is happening. Laura Lee stands up and tells Lottie, you gotta go. If you don't get warm soon, you're gonna die. And she pushes her. And when she does that, Lottie is collapsed on the snow, freezing. So Lottie didn't really have a lot of luck, and Natalie did. She found a moose frozen in the lake. She rushed back to the cabin to get some help so they could pull this thing out. And most of the girls were on board with this idea, except for Mari. She pointed out that they agreed there would be no help. And people like Ben and Misty look at her and say, Mari, that's ridiculous. This is food we're talking about. So a group of them go out to the frozen over lake, try to strap some ropes around this moose's head, and pull it out. But unfortunately, it's too much, and the thing sinks to the bottom of the lake, and they're left once again without food. They then head back to the cabin empty-handed, and Natalie starts trying to warm up. Now the group that didn't go to help Natalie went to go find Lottie because they had no idea where she was, and they find her near that plane. They bring her in. And when Natalie hears the commotion, she gives up the hot tub for Lottie so that she can warm up. Two people, though, that weren't in the cabin were Thaisa and Van. Van had noticed a pattern with the trees with markings. 
she found the map that Ben had created and she started pointing out the trees and she noticed that the pattern was that they created the symbol in the tree. She showed Thaisa and Thaisa doesn't believe it, just thinking that you can make anything out of the pins. But Van says, well, if I'm right, then a tree should be right here, pointing to the map and saying, let's go find out. So Thaisa tags along, trying to just prove to Van that it's nothing. And when they get to that location, it is nothing. There's no symbol in the tree, but it is something weird. The entire ground's covered in snow, except this one patch. It's melting. They then suddenly hear something, and they think that it might be food, but it's not. It's a person. They run. They tackle this person, and it's Javi. The girls bring Javi back to the cabin, and everybody is shocked to see him. Nobody ever expected to see him again, especially Travis, who wraps his arms around him and is thrilled to see his brother, but... Javi is despondent. It's as if he doesn't really remember any of these people. He just kind of looks around and doesn't say anything. Mari then remembers that Javi being alive was something that Lottie had predicted, so she points that out. And Van says, well, if it wasn't for Thaisa, knowing where he was, we never would have found him. Thaisa once again says, no, that's just a coincidence. But Van says, you can't ignore it anymore. There is something deep inside of you that is connected to all of this. In episode 5, after Javi came back, he didn't talk, and it lasted for a couple of weeks. But because Lottie was right, some of the girls, like Thaisa, ended up buying into the idea that Lottie had something different going on with her that they needed to buy into. So, at the behest of Van, Thaisa started attending this sort of spiritual circle that Lottie would hold about getting in tune with nature It's basically what she ends up doing as an adult, but this is where it really first started. And right after Tysa started going, she stopped sleepwalking. So she bought into it even more. But not everybody has bought in this thing. Shauna certainly hasn't, and neither is Natalie. Natalie at the moment is dealing with the fact that Travis feels like she completely betrayed his trust by lying about planting the evidence that Javi was killed. He yells at Natalie, you know, if you didn't do that, maybe I would have found him earlier. And maybe he would still be talking. So he's pretty pissed off. And it's understandable. His brother has yet to say a word, and they keep chalking it up to, uh, he'll talk when he's ready. But everybody's wondering, how did he survive, and where the hell did he go? Eventually, though, he does speak. But it's not to his brother, it's to Ben. All Javi's done since he's come back is draw pictures. And Ben picks one up, and Javi says to him, She told me not to come back. When Ben asks, who told you not to come back? Javi just simply says, my friend. He then takes the paper back and doesn't explain anything else. And only Ben actually heard him talk. But Javi coming back doesn't change the fact that chores need to be done. Mari walks around with the cards that dictates what people will do. And Crystal has to once again take the bucket of shit out and throw it over the cliff. And her, quote, bestie, Misty, decides to go with her to help her out. And these two are really getting along. I mean, the term bestie is applicable because they're both weird as hell. But as they get to the cliff and they start talking about their secrets that they've kept from one another, and most of them are pretty innocent secrets, like, for example, Crystal's actual name is Kristen, but they called her Crystal Day One and she just stuck to it. Misty decides to reveal a very big secret. When the plane crashed, she liked the fact that everybody was acting like she was useful for once, so she decided to destroy the black box. When Crystal hears this, her entire mood changes. The secrets that they were keeping from each other are no longer fun. This one's really troubling because she now knows that Misty is the whole reason why they haven't been rescued yet. Misty tries to act like she was just joking, but as Crystal points out, Misty, you're a terrible actress. Misty starts to get really, really concerned that Crystal's going to go back and tell the group. So she gets tough with her, threatening her, saying that if she does, she's going to kill her. But she's backing up Crystal more and more until finally there's no more room left for Crystal to go. And she falls off the side of the cliff. And it wasn't like Misty was planning on that. It was a complete accident. But Crystal is absolutely dead. Misty makes her way down to the cliff and she tries to resuscitate the body. But the entire area is suddenly getting caught up in a snowstorm. And Misty and Crystal weren't the only ones out in the woods. So were Shauna and Thaisa. Because as Shauna was sleeping, she woke up to hear Lottie speaking to the baby. 
and she hated it. She doesn't appreciate the fact that Lottie is speaking whatever gibberish she is to her unborn child. She's uncomfortable with it. And it was Thaisa who came to the defense of Lottie, saying, you know, Shauna, she's not hurting anybody. And Shauna got so infuriated about the fact that Thaisa didn't have her back that she stormed out of the cabin into the woods. And Thaisa followed suit. Shauna told her that she doesn't like the fact that Thaisa all of a sudden is getting wrapped up in this Lottie crap. That the idea that they're still one team is just that. It's an idea because it's not reality anymore. There are clearly packs going on. And she thought that Thaisa had her back, but she doesn't. As Thaisa was explaining to her, yes, I do have your back. Shauna felt a sharp pain in her stomach and she bent over. It came as quickly as it went. But then they too, just like Missy realized, oh crap, a snowstorm's coming. We have to get back. But as they were traveling back, the pain got worse and worse. The snow got heavier and heavier, and they were getting lost. Now, Misty made it back first, and what she told the group was that Crystal just disappeared. One minute she was there, and when she looked back, she's lost. And the group doesn't really care about Crystal. They're more concerned with the fact that Shauna is out there, pregnant, along with Taisa. So they want to go out there and find them. The snow is way too thick for them to actually form a search party, though. So they go outside and they use some of Lottie's techniques that she's been using in that circle. And it just so happens that Thaisa is doing the same thing. And somehow she finds her way back to the cabin. But Shauna's is going into labor. Now present day Shauna has a whole other mess on her hands. Because as she's sitting there with Jeff, Callie comes in and says, Hey guys, don't get mad, but I might have messed up. Callie had continued seeing Matt, and the two went bowling. Of course, this whole thing was a work for Matt. He was trying to get information on Shauna via Callie. But Callie didn't realize that until the bill came while Matt was in the bathroom. Callie noticed the name, she Googled it, and she found out that Matt was a cop. But instead of confronting him about it, she played him right back. She told him that she recently found out who her mom had an affair with. It was her dad's best friend, Randy. So she comes home and she tells both Shauna and Jeff this, and initially they're pissed off. But Shauna realizes that this could actually work in their favor. That, yeah, it's dumb that her daughter was dating someone way older than her, but she was smart about it. And if the cops believe this, then that should eliminate her as a suspect. But she has to make sure. She figures the cops are probably trailing Callie, but also trailing Shauna. So they have to convince them. She tells Jeff to have Randy meet her at a motel to make it look like they're having an affair. And Shauna's hunch is right. Matt and Kevin follow her to the motel. They see Randy open the door. And as far as Kevin's concerned, that's it. That's the confirmation that they need. But Matt doesn't feel like this is it. He wants to stick around. Shauna is actually so detailed that she hands Randy a condom and says, go in the bathroom and, you know, have fun. Problem is, Randy can't work like that. My dude's chafing. His tail is tapping out from the beating it's enduring. So Randy decides to improvise, and he puts some lotion in the condom, and the two walk out. Matt wants to make sure, though, that they're not being played. So after Shauna and Randy leave the motel, Matt and Kevin head in. And Kevin thinks this is a complete waste of time until Matt finds the condom and notices something about it. It doesn't smell like that stuff, no. It smells like strawberries. And Matt realizes, yeah, we are being played. Because this thing is filled with lotion. He excitedly tells Kevin she wanted us to think that she was having an affair with Randy to get her off the scent that she was having an affair with Adam. Kevin reminds him, yeah, but that also means that the daughter gave you false information, so your cover's blown. As for Thaisa, she shows up at Van's video store, and it's been a long time since these two have seen each other. Van can tell from Thaisa's state that she's just not popping in to see how she's doing. She asked Thaisa, All right, how long have you been sleepwalking again, and how bad is it? And Thaisa fills her in on just how bad it is, sacrificing a dog and all. Van asks her, okay, well, what do we do now? And Thaisa says, well, I was hoping I could take a shower. I just hitchhiked through Pennsylvania. I'm not really smelling great. So Van lets her take a shower, but as Thaisa is cleaning up, she notices that Van has a bunch of oxycodone. She questions her about it, thinking that it's hers, but Van says, The V doesn't stand for Vanessa, it stands for Vicky. She got cancer a few years back and passed away. And Vicky was Van's mom, who she didn't have the best relationship with. 
The conversation then gets back to Thaisa and what she needs from Van. And it gets pretty contentious, but Van assures her, we'll figure this out together. In the middle of the night, though, Van notices that Thais is sleeping. And she sneaks over to where she stashed those oxycodone pills, and she swallows one, feverishly, like she definitely needed it. When she turns around, Thaisa is wide awake, but she has crazy eyes. Thaisa grabs her and kisses her, and Van realizes this isn't Thaisa, this is that other person. Van asks her, what do you want? And this other Thaisa says, this isn't where we're supposed to be. And maybe they're supposed to be at Lottie's cult, where Natalie has seemed to buy in a little bit more. She's wearing purple. She's going to some therapy sessions. And she even gets a visitor because Misty and Walter found her. Although they're surprised not only to find out that it's Lottie who's running this cult, but that Natalie doesn't want to leave. Natalie actually yells at Misty saying, I don't need you getting in my way, and then walks back. And since it's a gated community, they can't get in. What bothers Misty more than anything is the fact that she never even considered Lottie. She kept tabs on all the living yellow jackets, but she just let Lottie fall through the cracks. Walter points out that the real reason why they showed up was to make sure that her friend was okay, and it seems like her friend certainly is, so maybe they can move on. But Misty says, I'm not leaving her here. She's not safe with them. Lottie was institutionalized in Switzerland. But Walter thinks that Misty's reluctance has to do with the fact that she murders for her friends. He tells Misty that he looked into that whole backstory regarding Adam's mom, and he found out that Adam's mom is dead. He's not freaked out by this, though. He recognizes that Misty does have some serial killer tendencies, but that's okay. He still likes her, regardless of her extracurricular activities. But she gets so insulted by this that she gets out of the car, grabs her stuff, and says, you can go now. Because she ain't leaving. In the middle of the night, she actually buzzes the compound and begs the person that opens the door, please, I want to join. But inside, there's a whole other mess going on. While it looked like on the surface that Natalie was buying in, in reality, she was just playing a game in order to catch Lottie in this scam that she was convinced that Lottie was running. She was able to sneak into Lottie's office and through some files found out that Lottie had all this information on everybody in the compound including bank records. So in her true detective moment, she rushes into a crowded room and screams, she's playing all of you, revealing this Watergate moment. But Lottie says, yeah, they all know. They gave me that information. It's kind of embarrassing for Natalie. Lottie tells everybody to leave her and Natalie alone in the room so the two can talk. And when they are alone, she says, you know, you're looking for something in my office that's really in your head. Travis said that you were right about something, and it was obviously very important to him, and don't you want to know what that is? Because I do, and I'm pretty sure I have an idea of how to figure it out. She takes Natalie in her office and starts flashing a light in her eye, telling her to picture the last time she saw Travis, and Natalie starts to. They were together in a hotel room, doing a bunch of drugs, and Natalie overdosed. When that happened to her, she saw the crash site, but it was different. None of them made it. And there was something else out there. When she was brought back to life via Narcan, she told Travis, I felt it. We brought it back with us. Through doing this exercise, she tells Lottie that what Travis was referring to in the note was what she told him after coming to from the overdose. He was confirming the fact that they did bring it back with them. That darkness that was out there. And she feels like the darkness is still inside of them. Natalie then rests her head on Lottie's lap, and Lottie gets really uncomfortable. And when she looks to her left, she notices that the shadow is bearing some antlers, and she gets terrified. In episode 6, Shauna went into labor, and this might come as a surprise, but it didn't go all that great. Surprisingly, girls in the middle of the woods with no medicine and no proper tools had a little bit of trouble delivering a baby. Especially Misty. She thought she'd be built for this kind of thing, but when she got a look down there, she kind of clammed up. And I can't criticize. Same thing happened to me when my son was born. It's a war zone down there. But without the proper tools and medicine, the best thing that they decided to do was do some of Lottie's weird ritualistic things. Travis grabs an animal skull off the wall. He cuts his hand, squeezing blood on it. Other girls placed offerings down on the skull as well, 
And at the end of it, Lottie patches up Travis and tells him, the wilderness recognizes your sacrifice. But all this was in an attempt to make sure that the baby is delivered safely. The problem is all those sacrifices apparently weren't good enough because Shauna is losing a lot of blood and she's also losing a lot of color out of her face. Misty's really the only one that is kind of trained for this situation, so Lottie has to go and convince her to give it one last go. And as she's trying to deliver the child, Shauna passes out. In her passed out state, she has a very vivid-like dream where she wakes up and everybody's happy and there's a healthy baby boy waiting for her. Issues do arise later as the baby won't latch on when Shauna tries to breastfeed. And Shauna gets really concerned with that because the baby does need to feed. She also gets really upset when she woke up in the middle of the night and Lottie was the one that was feeding the baby saying, You weren't producing milk and we need to feed. Shauna yells at Lottie, What did you just say? But this time Lottie says, I said he needs to feed. Either way, it's an uncomfortable scene for a newborn mother that another woman is breastfeeding her child and Shauna takes the baby back. Eventually, Shauna is able to get the baby to latch, but later that night, she wakes up and the baby's gone. And when she goes into the living room, her teammates are, well, let's just say they were hungry and they look like a pack of wolves. I mean, demonic-like state. That is when Shauna snaps out of it, waking up from this fever dream to learn that none of it actually happened. And sadly, Shauna lost the baby. She's beside herself because she felt everything. It all felt so real. And she has real trouble accepting the fact that the baby is just not alive. She screams at all the girls, you can't hear him crying? I can hear him crying. You can't hear him crying? But no, none of them can hear him crying. Now, modern day Shauna, she's also going through it. After what the cops found about the fake affair, they called her up and they told her that they wanted to speak to her and Callie down at the precinct ASAP. When Jeff finds out that Callie's involved in this, he gets really upset because this is what he was worried about, roping their daughter into their mess. Shauna shoots back that she didn't drag Callie into this. Callie was the one that decided to act up and date a cop, and it would have been better for them had she just slept with him because then everything would be admissible. Either way, though, they can continue to argue it's not going to change the fact that they do need to head down to the precinct. As Shauna and Callie were heading to the precinct, Misty was checking herself in to Lottie's cult. She wasn't happy about the fact that she had to give up her cell phone, especially because the damn thing was blowing up from texts from Walter. But ultimately, she does hand it over because her mission is to get Natalie back. Before she runs into Natalie, though, she runs into Lottie who was really, really surprised to see her. Lottie asks Misty what she's doing there, and Misty explains she's trying to get her friend back from what looks like a kidnapping turned into a brainwashing. And in the middle of Lottie explaining that this isn't a cult, she gets a pain in her head and then asks Misty to stay. Misty still hasn't found Natalie, so she agrees. And unlike Natalie, Misty buys into the stuff pretty quickly. And by that, I mean putting on the purple outfits, getting into some drum circles integrates herself pretty easily to this group. Natalie, however, isn't going to the group. She's firing off guns at soup can targets trying to make herself forget about what she did to Travis. Lisa tries to talk to her, but Natalie says, you need to get away from me. I ruined people. I killed my best friend and he was the only person who loved me. And this whole time I was saying it was Lottie, but it was my fault. Lisa tries to make Natalie feel better by saying, Whatever happened to Travis, that was already inside of him. You didn't say anything to put it there. But Natalie says, well, whatever that was inside of him, it's also in me. I mean, we did so much messed up stuff out there, and maybe it was to survive, but I don't think we deserve to. Now, the reason why Lisa has to step in and not Lottie is because Lottie went off for another therapy session, even though she wasn't due for another six months. The reason she went off is because the visions continue. And they're getting stronger. She tells her therapist that whatever it is feels like it's pointing her to back then. The doctor brings up that this could just be a side effect of her psychosis, but Lottie says, no, I'm not worried that I'm ill. I'm worried that I never was ill. I mean, all these coincidences, Natalie shows up and now Misty, it's as if it's trying to show me that it was real. And that I wasn't the only one who felt it out there. It was all of us. It was a part of us. When the psychiatrist asks, what is it? Lottie yells, 
the power of that place and the God of that place. We did terrible things in its name. As Lottie is trying to get some answers from her therapist, back at her compound, Misty has finally gotten her hands on a phone, and she finally gets in touch with Thaisa. Thaisa is still with Van. Seems like she's kind of driving her nuts a little bit. But when the two find out about Lottie's compound, they hop in the car and they make their way upstate to go see exactly what Misty's talking about. On the way over, they get into the fact they're both surprised Lottie is back and she's the founder of a cult. They also get into the relationships, mainly what Van's up to and how she's kind of just doing casual encounters at the moment. But at no point is the conversation all that comfortable and it definitely feels like two people that used to date and are no longer doing such. Thaisa does end up calling Shauna's phone to let her know about what's going on, and Jeff answers. He was outside in the car waiting for Shauna and Callie to wrap up their interviews. They go in for the interview process, and Shauna sits down with a very cocky and arrogant Matt, who thinks that he's just true detective this whole case. At first, Shauna tries to play tough with Matt, but for whatever reason in the interview process, she kind of breaks down a little bit. And she admits to having the affair with Adam because at the time it just made her feel good. But she never admits to killing him. She does beg Matt to leave Callie out of it, but all Matt does is continue to question her on Adam Martin. Now in the other interrogation room, it goes way differently. Callie remembered what her mom said about sleeping with Matt, how that would have been better. So she puts on the waterworks and exploits that, telling Kevin that she was a virgin and Matt took advantage of her to get the information on her mom. This is something that Kevin doesn't believe. I mean, Matt has some weird tactics, but even that would be crossing the line. And Callie looks at him and says, well, I guess we'll let a jury decide. It's going to be interesting when they ask me to describe his weird balls. A short while later, both interviews end. Shauna ends first, and she heads in the car with Jeff. And Jeff tells her what Thaisa said about Lottie, her compound, and the fact that her and Van were headed up there because Misty and Natalie are already there. He then asks Shauna about the interrogation, and she comes clean that she admitted to the cops she had an affair with Adam. And Jeff gets upset at that. But he gets even more uncomfortable when he sees that she's driving around with a gun in her glove compartment. He finally yells at her, you're not all right. You know, maybe you do need to go up to this compound that Lottie's hosting. All your friends are going to be there. It could do you some good. The car door then opens and Callie comes in. She's really proud of herself for what she did, but she can tell that the mood in the car is tense. She gets concerned and says, are we going to jail? And Shauna says, of course not. But Jeff cuts in and says, well, if your mom has any sense, she's going to go away for a little bit on a little road trip. So now you've got Misty and Natalie already there, Van and Thaisa heading there, as well as Shauna. Meanwhile, at the compound, after Natalie has a really good conversation with Lisa, she comes into the common area and she sees Misty. Right away, she says, Misty, what are you doing here? And Misty says, well, you just didn't really seem like yourself, so I had to find out if you were okay. Surprisingly, Natalie doesn't tell Misty to leave. She just says, we're all like this, aren't we? A couple hours later, Shauna arrives. And right after Shauna, Van and Thaisa arrive. They give each other hugs, they get reacquainted, but Van is the most troubled at what she sees. And all she sees is Lottie staring off into the water. But Van is like in a frozen state. And even Lottie has some crazy eyes. But one thing that the women don't realize is this compound has a very interesting feature that you would only see from above, and Lottie's probably the only one that knows about it. Outside, the symbol that they had in the woods, is carved into the ground. In episode 7, the girls are reeling from the loss of the baby, nobody more so than Shauna. She's got her dead child wrapped up in a blanket, and she's just kind of holding it. Problem too is the girls can't leave because there's a horrible snowstorm that has kept them inside. But once the snow does stop and they open the door, they can then go outside, which Thaisa tells Shauna, it'll be good for you. She's able to finally bury her child which is really emotional for her. As the girls go outside, Ben stays inside, and he's been seeing visions of his boyfriend from back home. But this particular vision is scary, because his boyfriend gets a phone call, and when he answers it, he says he isn't ready, while looking right at Ben. He then hangs up, and he says, We need to talk. 
sit down. His boyfriend then says, Ben, you have to go. I mean, you had to know that this wasn't meant to be your hiding place. You know what? It doesn't matter. What does matter is you're no longer welcome here. He screams, Paul, what did I do? And his boyfriend says, you didn't do anything. It's just time. Paul then opens the front door to leave, and Ben goes after him. He yells, Paul, at the top of his lungs. But the only people that are there are Thaisa and Van. So they ask him, Coach, are you all right? And he snaps out of it, realizing that Paul isn't there. And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. One of the people that does not see Ben walk outside is Misty. She's with Mari and Akila, although she's kind of hanging back quite a bit. She's eavesdropping on their conversation. And Akila praises Misty for being so calm in that moment and trying to save the baby. But Mari, she's really never liked Misty, and she thinks that she's weird as hell. She also finds it amazing that Misty has yet to form a search party for her, quote, best friend, Crystal, which is making Mari think that maybe Misty had something to do with it. So as soon as everybody gets back, Misty puts on quite the acting performance, telling everybody that while everybody's still sad about the baby, they can't forget about Crystal. They need to go searching after her. A couple of people wonder if that's the trade-off they made, the baby and Crystal for the snow stopping. But Lottie says, no, that's not how it works. It doesn't trade and haggle. The wilderness hears us. It gave us what we wanted. Shauna lived. They all then get into a circle holding hands, and Lottie says, We hear the wilderness, and it hears us. Everybody repeating after Lottie. After this little ceremony, they then get ready to go out searching for Crystal. Right before Misty does leave, she overhears two of her teammates talking about how it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they found Crystal dead because they would have food. Now, neither of them want to say that. They're both hiding behind the whole, well, I mean, obviously we want Crystal to be found. But they're already thinking of eating her. Although, neither wants to say it. One person who will not be going to search for Crystal is Shauna. She's still reeling from the baby. And when Van takes off one of the sheets that they were using, revealing that blanket that Lottie had made for the baby that is covered in blood, all Shauna can think about is the vision she had of her teammates eating. So she grabs the blanket and throws it in the fire hoping to burn the memory out. But most of the teammates, though, they go out looking for Crystal. The first place they head is to that hollowed-out tree. Lottie starts doing some weird Lottie stuff and then tells the groups to break off. She holds Thaisa back and says, You found Javi. Maybe you can find Crystal, too? Thaisa, though, says, I don't think so. That wasn't me. And ever since I've been doing your circles, I haven't been sleepwalking. And that other me that knew where Javi was, I think she's gone. Lottie, however, says she's not gone, Ty, and that's a good thing. And then she walks off to try to go find Crystal. Misty had gone off with Akila and Mari, and that's because she really wants to sell to them that she didn't kill Crystal. She puts on the waterworks. She puts on quite a show. Akila tells her that she can go back because she's clearly too emotional for this, but Mari definitely has her suspicions. Misty, however, does not go back. She goes to try to find the body of Crystal. She does feel horrible about what happened, and she doesn't want to let her friends eat her. But when she searches the snow, there's nothing. Crystal's body is gone. When she gets back up to the top of the hill, she's surprised because Ben's there, staring at the edge. Ben's decided that he can't live like this anymore, and he's ready to go over the edge. Misty jumps into action, begging him to stop, walk it back, but he's pretty set in his ways. In a last-ditch effort, she tells Ben that Once they get home, she's going to tell the world that he made the moves on her, that he initiated their relationship, that he initiated relationships with all the girls. But that isn't working either. And then as one last ditch try, she says, I'll tell the whole world you're gay. Ben, though, looks over at her and says, tell him. Right before Ben is going to jump over the edge to his death, Misty cries her eyes out apologizing, saying she tried to save the baby. And she can't deal with this. She can't have any more deaths on her hands. So she pleads with him to step back from that ledge. And he does. Everybody then heads back to the cabin for nightfall. And Misty is humming Lightning Crashes by Live. And for whatever reason, Shauna snaps, yelling at Misty, Why are you singing that? Where did you hear that song? Missy doesn't really know, and she says, I think Crystal was singing it. But then all of a sudden, Shauna goes off and decks her. They try holding Shauna back. She ends up biting Van, and then Lottie gets in the way. 
She tells Shauna to let it out. Shauna punches Lottie, and Lottie turns to Travis and says, take Javi to the bedroom. She then looks right at Shauna and says, let it out. We need you, Shauna. And Shauna beats the crap out of Lottie. I mean, she beats her into a bloody pulp. It looks like Lottie is wearing a red mask at this point. Her face is bloody, bruised, but somehow she's still breathing. Now, present day, the girls have all convened up at this commune that Lottie has started. Lottie's excited to see her friends, but she's also ready to introduce them to treatment. Van, Thaisa, and Shauna, they're a little hesitant on it. But it's actually Natalie who convinces them to go through with it, saying how it really did make an impact on her. And they know that out of all of them, it would be Natalie who would be the most resistant to this kind of thing. So they all choose different methods of therapy. For Shauna, she has to take care of a goat, which she doesn't want to do because she feels like the entire day she's going to get attached to this thing and then she's going to be forced to kill it. She tells Lottie that she doesn't want to end up killing this thing, and Lottie says, well, you're not going to have to. But then she starts having a breakthrough. She tells Lottie that she's emotional because she's kind of kept Callie at arm's length her entire life because she's worried that she's going to die. And this trauma dates back to losing her child in the woods. But Lottie's there for her. The good news is, Shauna is getting something out of this therapy. As for Thaisa, she was tasked with painting a wall with a very tiny paintbrush. And she finds Lottie and says, yeah, I'm not really getting anything out of this. I came here because I'm sleepwalking again. Lottie tells Thaisa, you know, that other you, she always had a deep connection to the wilderness. And she had wisdom, too. And I know that she wants to hurt your family, but maybe she doesn't. Maybe that other you just doesn't want to be suppressed. She's still with you, Ty. Ty then goes off and finds Van. Van didn't do any therapy. She just went to grab a bottle of booze from her truck. After a very brief conversation, the two start making out pretty furiously, but they stop themselves. Thaisa starts apologizing, saying, you know, I've thought about this, but it's just going to be a long road before we or, or I. And Van cuts her off and says, Ty, I don't have time. I've got cancer, like the really bad kind of cancer. I've got weeks to live. Ty gets really mad that Van didn't reach out, but Van says, what were you going to do? I mean, send me an edible arrangement? Were you going to message me on Facebook? The reality is, Ty, we don't know each other. I was going to burden you with that. Misty then interrupts the conversation and calls both of them in. Unlike Van, she did go through her therapy reluctantly. She was put into a sensory deprivation tank. Basically, you just kind of float there in the darkness. But she definitely got something out of it. She started imagining her life with Caligula, her pet bird. She asked Caligula, when people look at me, do they just see someone desperate for love who's a murderer? And this bird helps her realize that's not the case at all. As soon as she gets out of there, she immediately rushed off to go call Walter, apologizing for how she acted. She tells him she never should have pushed him away, and then she hangs up. It does seem like, though, she just recorded a voice message. She didn't actually talk to him. But when she ends up meeting up with the rest of her teammates, she's in a great mood. The one person who's missing is Lottie. Lottie went to go have a therapy session. Even though she was going like once every six months, this is becoming a very routine habit for her. She tells her therapist that all of her teammates being here, she feels something in her body that she hasn't felt in years. It's deep and it's primal. And the scary part is it feels great. The therapist tells her, when does self-oppression help us? You just told one of your friends the same thing. I mean, maybe you're having this feeling because when you're with these women, you were your truest self. So why don't you embrace it again? And Lottie tells her therapist, we hurt each other. The therapist, however, asks her, is there anything of value in this life that doesn't come with risk? Lottie's kind of surprised and asks the therapist, are you saying what I think you're saying? But then all of a sudden, the therapist isn't the therapist. It's that person from the woods with the deer headdress on. And she asks Lottie, you tell me, does a hunt that has no violence feed anyone? Lottie is super freaked out, and when she snaps out of it, she realizes that she's been alone in that room the entire time. She wasn't talking to her therapist. She was talking to whatever it was they brought back from the wilderness. So when she finds her teammates, she tells them, I think it's best that you guys go. But they convince her to stay. They drink some booze throughout the night. They laugh. They dance. And then Shauna gets a phone call from Jeff. Jeff's a little freaked out because he tells Shauna, the police... They found the body of Adam. They found his remains. And that's big trouble. 
in episode eight, right after Jeff gets off the phone with Shauna, he gets a knock at the door, and it's the police. Kevin has come calling with a search warrant this time. After they found Adam's body, that was sufficient enough to go searching the home of their number one suspect, Shauna. Jeff tries to act like this is ridiculous, but it's pretty obvious that he is scared. He tells the police that Shauna's not there, she's at a retreat with her friends, but they think that has more to do with Jeff kicking her out of the house after he found out about the cheating and then also what she might have done, i.e. kill Adam Martin. So Kevin sits with Jeff as Matt searches the house. The first place he searches is Callie's room. She's filming him the whole time, mocking the fact that this will never hold up in court. After all, what's a jury going to say when she puts on the waterworks and says how he took advantage of her? And he's not worried about that because Kevin didn't believe it in the first place. He actually flips it on her and says, well, when a jury finds out what a liar your mother is, they'll find out that the psychopath man-eating apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And that hurts Callie quite a bit. But after searching the house and finding virtually nothing, they sit down with Jeff and they start showing him the photos of Adam's torn up body. It's pretty gruesome. There's no head, there's no hands, there's no feet. And whoever did this was surgical about it. I mean, they really knew what they were doing. So much so that they actually destroyed his tattoos on his body. It looks like it was done by a cheese grater. The only reason they know it was Adam is because he donated bone marrow years ago. And through that bone marrow, they were able to identify him. They think it could be Shauna because, after all, she does have experience from, you know, the whole woods thing. Jeff, though, gets so freaked out, he finally stands up and says, we're done. You know what? Uh, Next time I talk to you guys, I'm going to need a lawyer. Right before Kevin leaves, though, he does tell Jeff, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. There's still time for you and Callie to get out. You don't have to protect Shauna. But Jeff doesn't say a word, and the police leave. Although that night, neither Callie or Jeff can sleep, and they kind of sit down and have a tiny heart-to-heart. Callie's really concerned about what Matt said, the fact that she's not far off from her mother. And that's when Jeff reveals to Callie about what difficulty Shauna went through out in the woods, like losing a baby. Before this, Callie had no idea that she would have been a little sister to a big brother. Callie is visibly upset about it, and Jeff tells her, that's not your issue, that's me and your mother's. Now this whole time, Shauna was trying to get back to them, but she was stopped by her friends. Mainly, Van. She told all the girls that the body of Adam Martin was found, and only a few of them know how important that little detail is, like Misty, Ty, and Natalie. For Van and Lottie, they don't quite get why it's a big deal. But it doesn't take many questions for Van to figure out that they had something to do with that guy dying. So when Shauna tries to leave, Van grabs the keys and chucks them. Because they can't leave, they start questioning Shauna on a few of the details. Mainly, why is Jeff the one that's calling? And it forces Shauna to admit that Jeff knows everything, which the girls get pissed at because they kind of had a pact to stay quiet, keep it amongst themselves. But Lottie doesn't want to have these conversations out in the open, so she drags everybody to the sharing shack. And they all have to come out with their truths. Shauna tells the group everything that's going on with the Adam Martin situation. Misty is forced to open up about what happened with Jessica Roberts. And Natalie thinks they're making real progress talking about the issues. And maybe if they open up more about what they dealt with in the woods, it'll help. But Lottie says, no, we're not going to deal with anything talking about it. Something guided you all here. Now, whatever it is we brought back, I tried to bargain with it. I tried to will it away, but it's too powerful. And now we have to give it what it wants. She goes over to the bar and she starts filling up shot glasses. But the shot glasses aren't full of alcohol. One of them is filled with a euthanizer. They use it to euthanize animals because Lottie feels like what this darkness has always wanted was one of them to make the ultimate sacrifice and give themselves up. Right away, none of them want to do this. This sounds nuts, but Lottie goes around the room and says, well, Taisa, you almost killed your wife. Shauna, at this rate, you're going to lose your family. Misty, you already did kill someone. Natalie actually tried to kill herself and then Van. Van, you used to be so full of life, and now it's like something is broken in you. Van tells Lottie, why don't you drink it? And Lottie shoots back, you know that's not how it works. It will choose one of us, and we won't know until we all drink it. This helped us survive before, and it will help us survive now. 
We just have to give it what it wants. As all the girls are deciding whether or not to take their Kool-Aid, word has gotten out about Adam Martin and it's got to the Citizen Detectives group. Many on the page are reveling the fact that it was Shauna who's the lead suspect. They're joking about the fact that she was a cannibal. At least that's the rumor. One person who isn't laughing, though, is Walter. He jumps into action. Emailing the police department, I have some interesting information on your investigation, and then going in the closet, grabbing a purple coat, and heading out. Now, if there were police back in the woods years ago, Shauna would have been arrested for assault because she did a number on Lottie. So much so that they don't know if Lottie's going to make it. She's definitely got internal bleeding, and Misty's doing her best to keep her alive. Missy's so on edge that she actually snaps at Mari for the first time. Mari's always been rude to her, but when Mari makes a crass comment about the smell, Misty just loses her crap, yelling at her and saying that she's always been a little rat. And Mari puts on a tough exterior, but she's also going through it. As she's going downstairs, she drops the bowl and starts crying. Mari, though, isn't the only one. A few of them are going stir-crazy. We know about Thais's thing. Even though she's been doing better with sleepwalking, she's seeing visions of her other self. But no one knew about Akila until Thaisa saw Akila talking to something in her hand. And Akila had found a pet mouse a while back in the shed, and she decided to keep it as a friend. But that pet mouse wasn't alive. She just thought it was. It's Thaisa who has to walk over and say, Akila, you're petting something that's clearly dead. And it was at one point a mouse, but rigor mortis set in. And it's pretty horrifying to Aquila. But maybe these visions are brought up on the fact that they're starving. They're resorting to eating belt soup. That's right, leather belts. Because of this, some of them have the impure thought that Lottie dying wouldn't be the worst thing. It's one last mouth to feed. One of these people is Natalie, who tells Ben. And Ben says, yeah, it probably wouldn't be the worst thing if she was put out of her misery. Natalie would also like Lottie to go because she's noticed a change with her teammates. They're all enamored with Lottie. It's like she has this power amongst them. Natalie's really the only one at this point that doesn't buy it. She says even Javi buys it. While Javi doesn't speak, she saw him bowing at a symbol tree. That's what they're calling those trees that are marked with the symbol. Ben gets interested on what tree Javi would be bowing to, so he looks through Javi's sketch pad and finds an interesting item. It looks like a tree's roots. He then starts looking in the map that he created, and he starts searching for this tree. And after a while, he does find it. I mean, it is a cave right out of The Hobbit. It's a hollowed-out tree that underground would keep somebody warm. And there are bones of some kind of animal, so it explains what Javi was up to while he was out in the wilderness missing. But as Ben was making this discovery, another girl was seeing visions, and this time it is Mari. She sees blood pouring out of one of the walls. But when she starts freaking out, the girls snap her out of it, and it's nothing. So the girls are hungry. Most of them are seeing things, and they've got Lottie to deal with. And Lottie knows that her predicament is a tough one to overcome. Because of this, she tells Misty, If I die, don't waste my body, a.k.a. eat me. Misty goes downstairs and relays the message to the group, and they're not ready to let Lottie go. In fact, they think it's imperative that they keep Lottie alive because they feel like the only reason they are alive is because of Lottie. They also know, though, that the wilderness probably wants a sacrifice. So they all agree that they need food and they need to keep Lottie alive and they need a sacrifice. They feel like it's only fair that they do this thing randomly, let the wilderness decide. Van shows everybody a card. It's the Queen of Hearts with her eyes sketched out and then she starts shuffling the deck. One by one, they go around the room until the wilderness decides that it's Natalie who will be the sacrifice, the one person who doesn't really believe. Shauna is tasked with cutting Natalie's throat, and some of them have these really crazy looks in their eyes as they're waiting for Shauna to do it. Shauna, though, is sketched out by it. It's tough for her to cut one of her teammates' throats as she's looking her in the eye. But Travis doesn't want to allow this to happen. He knocks Shauna over and tells Natalie to get the hell out of there and run. Some of the girls grab Travis and keep him at knife point, while others go running after Natalie into the woods. And it's a pretty crazy sight. You've got Van, you've got Misty, you've got Shauna, you've got Thaisa, 
Mari, Akila, a few others, and they're literally hunting their friend. The only person in the woods that is a friendly is Javi, who's the first one to reach Natalie and says, come here, I got a place that you can hide out. The others don't know about it. And of course, he's talking about that tree cave. They start running towards it as the group is trying to catch up, but Javi ends up falling through the ice. Natalie doesn't think about herself. She thinks about trying to save Javi. But when the rest of them catch up to Natalie, they don't kill her. They just instead pull Natalie away from saving Javi because they feel like the wilderness has spoken and Javi will end up being the sacrifice. So they all, some mortified, some not, just sit back and watch Javi drown. They then quickly pull up his body and now they have their sacrifice, but they also have food. And in the season finale, the girls return back with Javi's body. And the only thing that Natalie can muster to Travis is the wilderness chose. Natalie's pretty broken up about this. And as you can imagine, so is Travis. He finally got his brother back only for his brother to die. Natalie tries to explain him what happened, but he just doesn't want to hear it. And the rest of the girls, they're just focused on the fact that they now have food. Shauna is going to prepare Javi's body, and while she's doing that, Misty goes to check on Lottie, and Lottie asks, why was Travis screaming? And Misty explains that they kill Javi in order to eat him to stay alive. Misty goes through exactly how they chose what happened with Natalie and how Javi ended up dying, so they just accepted it. And that's not what Lottie wanted at all. She gets really upset when Misty explains that they killed Javi to keep her alive. They didn't want their leader to die. Lottie looks at Misty and says, how could you let this happen? And Misty says, how could I let it happen? Lottie, you started this. It's done. And it's going to save all of our lives. Misty then heads back downstairs and lies to the girls, telling them that Lottie is pleased with the wilderness's choice. And the fact that Lottie has given her blessing, or at least the girls think that she has, turns a lot of frowns upside down. Now, this whole time, Ben has been missing. He was at the location of where Javi was camped out. And when he returns, he sees that Shauna is chopping up meat, and it doesn't take him too long to figure out that it's Javi. The first person he actually talks to, though, is Natalie. And he excitedly tells her about Javi's hideout saying, we could go there. We could spend the rest of the winter there. We would survive. Because me and you, we're not built like them. They're off their rocker. But Natalie doesn't take him up on the offer and says, no, coach, actually, I'm worse. Because it was supposed to be me, and I just let him die. She then looks him dead in the eye and says, you're a good person, coach. You really don't belong in this place. Later that day, when no one's looking, Ben steals a lot of supplies, including rope, matches, and he heads to that cave by himself. While Natalie was talking to Ben inside the cabin, Travis is really upset, and he tells Van, you should be ashamed of yourself. But Van is actually seemingly happy about this. She says, I'm not ashamed of myself because I'm surviving, and I don't think any of us should be ashamed of surviving. She then tries to convince Travis on why he should eat Javi, and how eating Javi would actually honor his life. Because Javi gave his life to keep his brother alive. And to waste that, well, that would just be disrespectful. So later that night, when Shauna comes in with some of the meat from Javi, she hands over his heart to Travis. And none of the girls know what Travis is about to do. But he surprises all of them by taking a bite out of it. He then throws it in a hot skillet. And they all pour some of the meat into that skillet to cook it. They all start eating it once it's done, and Misty takes some up to Lottie. But Lottie doesn't want to eat it. And Misty tries to convince her to take it, saying that she needs her strength. Lottie just shakes her head and tells Misty, I thought that it wanted what was best for us, but now I'm not so sure. Misty doesn't want to hear that, though. She says, end? Your team needs you right now. Eat. And it's not a request. So Lottie eats once everybody's done, they just decide to start telling stories. And Van starts telling a story that seems like it's made up, but in reality, it's the origin of the cabin. And in the middle of it, Lottie interjects and says, I never wanted to be in charge, but I felt like it chose me because I knew how to listen. But now I don't hear it anymore. 
And I think it's because I've taught you all to listen to it. So I think you need a new leader. Now, none of them want to accept the fact that Lottie is stepping down, but she doesn't give them a choice. And she elects Natalie to be the new leader, saying that it's obvious. The wilderness saved Natalie and saved her for this reason. Lottie then walks over to Natalie and kisses her hand like a subject would to a queen. And then one by one, they all start following suit. But outside, Ben had actually returned. He wanted some more supplies. And he's horrified by what he's looking at. He's looking at these girls going through a ritual after eating one of their friends. It's clear to Ben that these people in the cabin are evil at this point. They're too far gone. They're beyond being saved. So maybe he's the reason why the cabin lit on fire that night. But that night, Shauna wakes up to the smell of smoke and tells everybody that they got to get the hell out of there. The doors are locked, though, so it takes a little bit of effort to actually free themselves. But once they do, one by one, they pile out of the cabin, saving what they can, and then they just have to watch it burn. And Ben is nowhere to be found. Now, present day, nobody's real keen on drinking Lottie's poison shots. They start going back and forth with Lottie, arguing with her, until Shauna steps up and says, you know, I actually agree with Lottie. She's right. If we want to get rid of this, we have to do things the way we used to. But that doesn't mean taking shots. We should give it a hunt. Most of the girls at this point think that Shauna has joined Lottie by being crazy. And it certainly doesn't help the fact that Lottie goes over, gives Shauna a big hug while just repeating, yes, yes, thank you. Because Lottie finally has somebody on her side, while the rest of the room is just shocked that Shauna has joined that side. Shauna, though, gives all the girls a look like, hey, I'm just telling Lottie what she wants to hear. So one by one, they start agreeing that this is a good idea, knowing that they're not actually going to go through with it. It's just getting Lottie off of the poison shots. Shauna turns to Lottie and tells her that they need to make sure none of the people at the commune are awake for this. They need the woods. And Lottie says, yeah, no problem, and starts going through the commune to make sure everyone's going to be asleep. Once Lottie leaves, Shauna tells the group, okay, I just bought us some time, but we got to figure out what to do with her. Most of them want to just admit her. With her previous history, it wouldn't be that hard. But Natalie says, yeah, she just wanted us to drink poison shots. I don't think simply admitting her is going to get it done. She says, yeah, we all went through it out there, but we got over it. She didn't. I mean, she's over here thinking that it's talking to her. Did we all forget where that leads? So it's kind of split. The plan is to admit Natalie, but it's also to prepare in a weird way for a hunt. So the girls kind of all split up. The first place that Natalie goes is to meet with Lisa and tell her, you got to get out of here. But she can't give her any details, and that piques Lisa's interest. Misty, meanwhile, went to go get her cell phone. Although she heard somebody coming, she hid. Her cell phone started buzzing, and it turns out that the person that was in the room was Walter. He showed up to help out. He's got a whole plan laid out on how to get this situation under control, and Misty goes along with it. His plan is going to include some other surprising visitors to the commune, Kevin and Matt. They were tailing Jeff and Callie, who have also shown up, and they're running around somewhere. But they couldn't figure out where Shauna was, so they decided to tell those two, thinking that maybe they would lead them to Shauna's location. So you've got Kevin and Matt looking for Shauna, but also Jeff and Callie. And when Jeff and Callie look into a window and see Kevin there, they're pretty surprised and they got to figure out what to do. So Jeff walks in, interrupting a conversation with Kevin and Walter. His improvised plan is to admit that he was the one who killed Adam Martin. But before Kevin can actually arrest him, Kevin collapses. That's because Walter drugged Kevin. Jeff's a little freaked out, but Walter comes out of the shadows, introduces himself very calmly, and then demands that Jeff help him get this body out of there before they're caught. They take Kevin's body and throw it into the trunk. And then they end up calling Matt, who at this point has located Callie. But they freak Matt out because Walter, while talking with Kevin, had been secretly recording him. So he just starts replaying Kevin's voice into the phone. And it gets Matt pretty concerned. 
When this happens, he completely bails on Callie and starts searching for Kevin. He eventually locates the trunk where Kevin's body is, and when he opens it up, Walter sneaks up, grabs Matt's gun, and shoots Kevin. He then explains to him that he's giving him an out on this. Because what Walter's been able to do is set it up like Kevin was the bad guy all along. He's got bank records indicating that it was Kevin who killed Adam Martin. And not only that, but he also killed Jessica Roberts. Now, the option that Walter is giving Matt is to be the hero. Make it look like he uncovered all of this. If he doesn't want to do it, Walter can also point the smoking gun to Matt's direction. They then both hear sirens because Walter took the liberty of alerting the local police that there was a matter at the commune. So Matt doesn't have a lot of time to figure out what he wants to do. Now, while all of that madness was going on, the girls were going through the ceremony. You had some of them waiting for a hospital psych team to show up and take Lottie away. That psych team, though, wasn't going to show up. That's because Van convinced Taisa to call them off. She played to the fact that Taisa is also going through something. And if Lottie should be admitted, then so should Taisa. Van just didn't believe that admitting Lottie would actually do her any good whatsoever. So you've got somebody like Shauna trying to delay this as long as possible, not realizing that the cavalry is not arriving. And after a while, Lottie and also Van get a little restless and they want to get through the whole ceremony of choosing the card and figuring out who has the queen. One by one, they go around until finally it is Shauna who pulls the queen out. The rest of them, seeing that Shauna is the one who's drawn the card, casually go over, grab the masks that were made earlier in the day, and put them on. And then they ask Shauna, do you want to submit or do you want to run? And Shauna can't believe they're actually going to do this. She thinks they're all nuts. But nobody says anything. They kind of just let Lottie do most of the talking. And when Shauna tries to walk away, Lottie takes that as Shauna's running. So she runs after her. She doesn't catch her, though. She ends up getting shot by Callie, who used the gun that was stashed in the minivan's glove box. Callie comes out of the woods to save her mother, and it's a bullet to the shoulder, so it's one that Lottie will survive. But Lottie's not even mad. She's just more blown away that she's meeting Callie for the first time. In fact, all the girls are pretty taken aback by this. When they all take off their masks, Lottie shushes all of them and says, It's here. It's with us right now. Shauna yells, Misty, where is this psych team? And that's when Van and Taisa come clean that the psych team ain't coming. Van starts pointing out that she feels like Lottie is screwed up because of what they did in the woods. It's their fault. And they can't abandon her. That's when out of nowhere, Lisa shows up holding a shotgun, demanding some answers. She's looking at her hero in Lottie, who is in a complete whacked out state. Natalie tries to get Lisa to put the gun down. And Misty, who is looking at her friend with a gun pointed at her, wants to try to jump into action and save her life. Misty has a syringe with a poison in it that will absolutely kill Lisa the moment she injects it. But when she goes to make a beeline for Lisa's neck, it's Natalie who steps in the way and takes it. As Natalie is slipping away, she finds herself in a completely empty plane. She doesn't think she should be there. And it's her younger self who says, this is exactly where you belong. We've been here for years. Then young Javi tells her that there's nothing to be afraid of. In the real world, though, she is dying. And Missy is really upset about it. But the wilderness is clearly chosen again. When the cops show up, they take out Natalie's body. And to the general public, it looks like it was a drug overdose. Lottie is also taken away. She's admitted to a psych ward. And Van and Taisa both tell her that they will visit her to make sure she's doing better. Matt ends up taking Walter up on his offer of exposing Kevin as the killer for both Adam Martin and Jessica Roberts. And then he goes over to Misty and excitedly tells her, I took care of it. But Misty is so upset because as she tells Walter, I just killed my best friend. And Walter has to console her. Shauna is also pretty upset about the fact that Natalie died. But they're all huddled around when they hear Lottie say, it is pleased with us. And that is the end of season two of Yellow Jackets. Thank you so much for getting this point of the recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. Be nice in the comments section if I messed something up. 
okay, fine. You know, mistakes happen. Get over it. Just hit thumbs down. Move on. I have merch. I have t-shirts. I have a Patreon. I have a bunch of ways you can help me out and give me money. But, hey, you watch this, and that's enough for me.